Welcome to the Missions Podcast. Before we get started with today's show, we wanted to let you know that we're doing things a little bit differently in today's episode. After the interview, stay tuned for a special bonus segment in which Scott and I sort of debrief the conversation we had and talk about some practical steps of application. Stay tuned for that. But for now, here's our special presentation of this interview with a very important guest. Stay tuned. This is a particularly exciting interview and topic that we're about to dive into. Uh, Number one, the idea of nations and what is a nation is perennially relevant. We talked about that years ago at our T4G special in 2020. It's coming up now, even as we're thinking through the political sphere and what does it look like to have Christian influence in our own country. Mm. Uh, But number two, we've got a guest returning to the show that we haven't spoken to since I don't even know what, episode three? And we're on yeah, episode a long time ago. 300 plus now. So it's been it's been a little while. But before we introduce our very important guest, Scott, uh, first, if this show is or has been or is going to be a blessing to you, we would appreciate you sharing with a friend because that's the best way that we can multiply its impact. And you can be a supporter of the show as well at missionspodcast.com slash support. And of course, doing all of the podcast things helps us as well. Liking it, sharing it, giving a positive rating and review that helps get this content in front of others that can be blessed by it. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to give this back as a resource to the church to empower missionaries uh, serving not only with our agency, but with other agencies. And we're so excited that you're partnering with us for another year on this show. Or if this is your first time listening, we're glad you're here, too. And so enough of that housekeeping stuff with some of that out of the way. Scott, how are you doing today and who are we talking to? Well, I'm I'm doing great. It's really good to have a former guest and someone who's been influential in on our podcast and as well as in, in the Christian world, Vishal Mangalwadi. I hope I did not say your name wrong. Uh, it's good to have him. He's a Christian philosopher, social reformer in India, political columnist, uh, writes and comments on a lot of things related to this world, and most recently, the author of a book called This Book Changed Everything, The Bible's Amazing Impact on Our World. It's really good to have you on the show again. Well, thank you for having me. So recently we had a guest on the show that we really enjoyed named Glenn Scrivener uh, out of the UK, and he wrote a book called The Air We Breathe. And we talked about just how the influence of Christianity and how pervasive it is and just every every aspect of, of life here in the Western part of the world. So we want to talk to you about your book and, and, and how it relates to, to missions and the nations. So how did Christianity shape the West? And you've write, wrote a lot about that. And what was the role of the biblical worldview in, in helping to form the culture that, that we see here and enjoy here, not only in the West, but also in India and around the world? Well, by, the Bible shaped the modern world in many different ways limiting myself to the Reformation, for example, which is the beginning of the Protestant movement. Protestant Reformation was a linguistic revolution which helped vernaculars such as German, English, Spanish, French override Latin. Latin was the lingua franca of Europe, but once reformers such as Luther, Calvin, realized that Every believer redeemed by the blood of the Lamb was supposed to be a priest and king. They realized that everyone must have... You can't serve God if you don't know God to be a priest. You can't manage God's kingdom if you don't know what God's will is. So you have to Mm. be able to study God's word. Therefore, God's word should not be in Latin. It should be in German. It should be in English. So... The Reformation created the modern linguistic revolution, which came to India and created or transformed all of modern Indian vernacular languages, where oral dialects, except for one or two which did have writing, uh, but these were oral dialects that were turned into literary languages by missionary movement, beginning with William Carey, Henry Martin, and Claudius Buchanan, and many others. So it was a The Reformation was a linguistic revolution that Jesus, the Son of God, when he comes here, he doesn't speak in Hebrew, his sacred language, nor does he speak in Greek, which is the lingua franca of the learned community at that time. And all his disciples write the New Testament in Greek, but he speaks in Aramaic, the language of the people, because God is seeking to make people his children. He wants to communicate directly with people. 
the Reformation was also an educational revolution, what I call the second education revolution, the idea that every uh, child of God should be educated to know truth, because it is truth that transforms, not protests that transform, that liberate. So it uh, began uh, the educational revolution. The Reformation was a political revolution. The very first book in Europe on politics as pursuit of freedom was written by Martin Luther in 1520. It's called a Treatise on Christian Liberty. In 1519, Luther started teaching the book of Galatians, which is Paul's fight for freedom. Galatians 5, one is that for freedom, Christ has set you free. Don't allow anyone to make you a slave, not even the Jewish believers who are coming from Jerusalem, James's followers. Don't allow them to circumcise you, to enslave you, because the gospel is about freedom. So Machiavelli's book, The Prince, was published in 1532. Luther's book, A Treatise on Christian Liberty, was published in 1520. The Western universities suppress the historical truth when they do not begin modern political theory with modern Luther, which, of course, Luther downplays the idea of kingship of all believers for practical and other reasons, but the idea develops better in Geneva, in particularly France with the French Huguenots, and then is implemented in Scotland in the Scottish Reformation, the kingship of all believers, which is what Modern democracy means, although people like John Knox didn't use the word democracy, uh, Knox kept saying that he was building the kingdom of God on earth. He was building the new Jerusalem, etc. But the Reformation was also the first and the most important sexual revolution of Europe. The Western world has had three major sexual revolutions. The first was biblical which is celebrated on 14th of February as uh, St. Valentine's Day. Shakespeare captures it in Romeo and Juliet, but it is really Martin Luther who is the father of the first sexual revolution uh, in his discovery that marriage is good. Mm. For 500 years before Luther, the Roman Catholic Church had suppressed sexuality as carnal. It is for second-class Christians. But sex is good. It is God who brings a naked Eve to a naked Adam for two of them to become one flesh so the two of them become three. This was God's idea, and God said this was very good. This is what Martin Luther and then his senior colleague, Karl Stad, began, mm -hmm. because of which uh, monks and nuns started quitting nunneries and monasteries and getting married. And Luther's own home in Wittenberg became the first Protestant parsonage because for 500 years, priests had not married. So uh, after that, of course, uh, Darwin and Kinsey and Freud, Freud, Kinsey, and then Hugh Hefner began the second sexual revolution. And now we are into the third sexual revolution where the Western learned elite do not know what is a boy and what's a girl. Right. But, uh, the, uh, well, let me let me hop like in that, there, so Vishal, because I think that's an incredibly helpful point. There's so much, really. We're barely scratching the surface of ways in which the the not only has the biblical worldview shaped aspects of how we tend to think in the West, but the history of Christianity in many ways overlaps with the history of civilization. Uh, because we Absolutely. see all of those areas of cross-pollination there. That's super helpful to think through. And you can go back into the archives as well and listen to our previous conversation with you to get some of that and pick up some of your books as well. I don't want to sort of exhaust your material there because revelationmovement.com, that's your website, and there's plenty to hear from as well there. But what I'd like to do is pivot a little bit into some of the missions uh, opinions and, and statements that you've shared lately. And you've been writing a few things and, and even saying a few things on social media, but I'd love to hear you kind of sketch out a little bit this idea of what is a nation. One of the things that, that I saw that you mentioned even in our, our notes in our conversation before the show is that there's really four types of political units that scripture gives us. And this, I think, is critical for missionaries because in the contemporary missionary movement, 
we've defined a nation pretty much exclusively as an ethno-linguistic people group. We sort of get that out of Ralph Winter and, and Donald McGavran and others uh, who developed that idea, especially in the 70s. But there's potentially other layers there that have to maybe inform our definition of what a nation is. And even right now, that's kind of a hot button topic. And so how should missions minded believers think about what a nation is and what does that have to do with the Great Commission? Thank you. Uh, Let me step back and just make that fourth point that Reformation was a political revolution which introduced to Europe the Mm. Jewish concept of nation. Everybody knows that Israel was a nation. At one point, it split, became two nations, Judah and Israel, 10 tribes and two tribes. But Israel was God had called Abraham, you walk with me, you follow me, I will make you a great nation, and through you I will bless all the nations. Uh, I will give light to the nations, bring healing to the nations, bring truth to the nations through you. So the nation was not a European idea. Ever Mm -hmm. since Alexander the Great, who responded to Persians' invasions, by becoming an invader himself and building the Greek Empire, followed by the Roman Empire, everyone in Europe wanted an empire. Spanish, Portuguese, Swedish, Austro-Hungarian, Russian, uh, England, Holland, Germany, France. Everybody wanted to be an empire. Nobody wanted to be a nation. Uh, Nation was a Protestant idea. It was the Dutch provinces who began the 80-year war. 50 years they fought alone against the Spanish and French. And then last 30 years, whole of Europe fought. And Europe formally accepted the Bible's idea of nation in 1648 in the Peace of Westphalia. Holland became the first nation which liberated itself from what was called Holy Roman Empire. It was neither Holy nor Roman. It was Spanish Empire. But Switzerland piggybacked on the 30-year war. And uh, when the uh, peace conferences began in Westphalia, which is the uh, northwestern part of Germany, the mayor of Basel was sent to argue that a Swiss confederacy, which had begun as three cantons, should be recognized as sovereign, independent republic, independent of the Holy Roman Empire, which is Spanish Empire. So Holland and Switzerland were the first two European nations, countries to be recognized as nations. They inspired the USA to become a nation and not an empire. So USA was very self-consciously developed as a nation, a great nation, which is coming together of 13 colonies, uh, provinces. Uh, that and becomes- real quick there, too, you use that term great nation, and you mean something very specific by that. You mean a, a, a sort of a, a nation as a unit that actually consists of multiple of what missiologists would call people groups. Is that, is that what you mean by great nation as opposed to nation? Yes, the Bible makes a distinction between nation and great nation. And Israel from the beginning was a great nation. So nation to define... So so was Nineveh, right? The the great city, right? There's sort of an idea. Well, it doesn't mean moral excellence. It it means something else, maybe size. Cities actually, uh, as Jacques Ellul points out in his book, Meaning of the City, uh, most of the empires begin as cities. Because city, by definition, uh, uh, a can after murdering Abel, he establishes the first city in the Bible. So city is an exploitative and oppressive social organization. So Babel, in, uh, so Babel or Babylon is the Bible's word for empire. Lucifer is in Isaiah 14 is Babylon. Um, so right up to Genesis 17, 18, when Babylon is overthrown, imperialism is overthrown, nations are healed. So the leaves Mm. of the tree for the healing of the nation. So in Genesis 11, God destroys 
Babel an imperial city, and I'll explain what the pro- moral problem with imperialism, and God scatters the people. Uh, nations are formed in chapter 11, described in chapter 10 of Genesis. In chapter 12, God calls Abraham that you follow me. I've just created nations, but I'll make you a great nations. And mm-hmm. that does not mean numerically. Israel has never been numerically a great nation. Today, there are a total of about 14 million Jews, uh, 7 or 8 million of them living in Israel, 4 or 5 million living in America and the rest of the world. Israel has never been numerically a great nation. Uh, God says to Abraham in chapter 18, verses 18 and 19, that Abraham will surely become a great nation because he will teach his children and his household his ethne and his non-ethne, to walk in my ways, do what is just, what is right, etc. So we can discuss what's the difference between nation and great nation. In brief, a great nation is several people groups, including several languages, living under one law, one covenant, one constitution. It is the law. So the basic problem with Dr. Ralph Winter, Donald McGovern, and the U.S. Center for World Mission, which began with Fuller Seminary, and which has impacted all of missiology departments, practically all, in uh, all the Bible school seminaries in America, whether you take Biola or Trinity or anybody else, defining nation as people group is the first flaw. Because in Genesis 11, all the people living there were descendants of Noah. They were one people group, one ethnicity. They became different nations because of confusion of language. Now, language means ideas, literature, concepts, the worldview. Because all the intellectual resources, whether they are mythical stories or serious philosophical speculation or scientific discoveries, they are encapsulated in words. So nations differ because of different languages, which means different ideas. Mexico and USA run on different ideas because they have different languages different literature, different history. So the anti-intellectualism of American seminaries reduced nation to ethnicity, but Dr. Winter was a great man, but it didn't occur to him that when we say that language is the reason for nations becoming differences, what we mean is literature. This is Okay, the, can I ask a question? Sure. I want to... I wanna, I want to follow up with just a couple of things here. One, sure. so help us understand, because I want to, like, we're dealing with a lot of philosophy here. I'm trying to follow it. I'm not sure I entirely agree with all of your, your reasoning on it, although I, I respect what you're saying. Uh, apply it to India, for instance, because I look at India, you and I were just talking about before, you're coming out to the Bay Area. We've got a lot of Telugu speaking people. I see, even though I'm not an expert in India, there's a huge difference between my Tamil brothers and my Telugu brothers, and from my northern Indian Punjab brothers that live out here in the Bay Area. Is India one nation, or is it as, uh, I forget what uh, what the... A great nation, multiple nations. Is it 2,000 nations, 2,000 ethne? ethne? Because I think scripture does both, scripture kind of uses it both ways, right? Like, you see it talking about people groups, and you see it talking about nation states. And I think part of the concern might be, too, and I'd love for you to speak to this as well, is that if we only define nation as a people group with a language and an ethnicity, that might mean that we only conceive of the missionary task as giving each ethno-linguistic people group, for instance, access to the gospel to the exclusion of also teaching them from the standpoint of culture, language, and all of the things that make each society unique, bringing those things under the lordship of Christ. I think that's what you're getting at, but I I do want to hear those answers to Scott's questions as well, too. Thank you. So India was never a nation. 
When the British started coming in the early 17th century, 1600 is when East India Company was formed. 1612 is when Britain first established a warehouse. They called it factory in Surat, Gujarat. India was Mughal Empire. So Mughal Muslims, with the help of sword, they had united warring Hindu-Muslim Sikh people groups, nations, tribes, into one political entity, which was empire. By the time the British were leaving, India was India, that is minus Pakistan and Bangladesh, was 562 princely states. So th these were states that were not fully administered by the British Empire. There were areas of India that were directly administered by the British, uh, that was British India, and then the British had treaties with kings who were still had certain autonomy in their own uh, states. So there were 562 princely states in India that were united into one great nation. So from day one, India was created to be a great nation governed by a constitution, by a law written by Lord Thomas Babington Macaulay, called Indian Penal Code. So the, it, it was a very biblical law applied to India. So a nation which is 562 states living together under one constitution and one law is a great nation. Now a nation becomes greater, closer it comes to God's law. If the national law conforms to God's law, it becomes a yeah. greater nation. That's what Moses is you. saying in Deuteronomy 4. So likewise, Israel was never one people group. From the days of J Moses and Joshua, Israel were 13 tribes because Joseph had become two tribes. 12 tribes were given provinces. The so territory is important part of nation. The 13th tribe was scattered amongst all the 12 tribes as the religious glue, uh, and I'll explain that, the function of the Levites and the priests. So Israel was never a nation in Dr. Winter and McGovern sense of the word. Israel was always a great nation because these were 13 tribes living together under one light, one constitution, one covenant, one law. So originally in Genesis 10 and 11, a nation is a people speaking one language, governing themselves in their own language, in their own territory. So governance, territory, language, and language means literature and laws, uh, history and mythology. These are important parts of the nations. But what transforms a nation or many nations into a great nation is living several people groups in several languages, living under one covenant, one constitution is a great nation. So Israel, USA, India began as great nations. They can degenerate into totalitarianism, where law doesn't rule, yeah. rulers be begin to rule. So these nations can degenerate, as did Germany, but the difference that the Bible makes between a nation and a great nation, and if you don't understand this difference, you don't understand the gospel, which is God's message to bring healing to the nations. And this is where Western missiology has completely failed during the last uh, generation since World War II, in not seeing the gospel as God bringing light and healing and blessing to the nations, but seeing the gospel only as a passport to, instead of going to hell, to go to heaven. This corruption of the Protestant gospel that is called evangelicalism in America today is a major problem in South America now that mm. the Protestant gospel has not brought healing to the nations in South America, because Protestant missionaries, that is Baptists, Pentecostals, Charismatics, did not understand mm. that God called Abraham to bless the nations, not just right. to take souls into heaven. 
And one thing that I appreciate about that answer is that you're kind of an equal opportunity offender, right? None of us are really off the hook because, you, you know, you throw in every denomination in there. Uh, I think that that's something that it, at least I would resonate with, that, that that's true. We tend to view the gospel narrowly and exclusively in terms of saving your soul out of a dying world rather than also bringing healing to the nations, light to the world, whatever that looks like, not adopting some sort of grand utopian vision, uh, but recognizing that the gospel changes everything. I think that's critically important. I think that's important for missionaries as well, that that our task is not only to see individual souls saved, although that is certainly part of the goal. And Paul said that he would suffer all these sorts of things for the sake of the elect, uh, but also to disciple the nations. And so we've defined nations, but something that you've also written and spoken about, and I do want to hit on this, is what it means to disciple. And specifically, you connect that with the idea of education there as well, which I, I think is critical. And I'd love to hear why you would connect it with the idea of education. And I think it has to do with some of these themes that we've already reviewed. Wow. Because again, if a nation isn't just ethno-linguistic people group, if it, if it also includes borders and territories and governing institutions, if all of that is kind of caught up in what a nation is, which granted a nation is a little bit hard to define, then to disciple nations means more than just seeing individual salvations, as important as those are. It seems to me that you would say that discipling a nation also means bringing some of those other things under the feet of Jesus in the sense of learning how to live in light of that gospel. And that seems to me to be where education, especially in things like linguistics and history that you're already leaning heavily into in this conversation alone, would become relevant there. And I think I think the crucial part of that is, is yes, I think almost every Christian would say we want to see all of these things influenced by the gospel. But how do those things get influenced by right. the gospel? That that tends right. to become the rub, because even as you're talking, Alex, if I were to say, well, what you're talking about sounds a, a little bit like social justice. You'd be like, no way. <laughs> that is not where I'm at. But, you know, because it comes down to like how those things are fleshed out becomes kind of critical, especially the, the missionary task, which we've talked about quite a bit. So I don't know. I guess we've we've love to hear your response. Thank you. You're very perceptive. And that's exactly what is being said. So God is saying to Abraham in Genesis 18, Abraham will surely become a great nation because he will teach his children and his household to walk mm. in my ways, justice, righteousness, etc. 430 years later, Abraham is saying in Deuteronomy 4, that I have taught you all these laws, statutes, ordinances, commandments. If you obey them, then your neighbors will say, what a wise people you are, what a wise nation you are, what a great nation you are, because as you obey God, God will dwell with you. He will bless you. Everyone will mm -hmm. see that God is with you, that you are a people of great laws. Now, that's what Samuel says. When these people want a king, Samuel says, okay, at the end, I will give you the king, but I will not stop praying for you. I will not stop teaching you. Mm. Because what you believe, so when we say that language is the origin of nation, separating two brothers who no longer understand each other because the language has been lost, original language has been lost, they have now potential right. of language, but they have to develop their own uh, vocabulary, their own grammar, their own legends, their own mythologies, their own stories and history. So when we say language, we mean ideas. Language has to be taught. ABC has to be taught. What does A mean and how do A and B relate? Adam and Bible relate. These things have to be taught. So when we are saying that language is the basis of a nation, it is certain ideas that are communicated through language, which people accept and live according to it. And those ideas in some ways have greater power than political people. So president of the United States might be the most powerful man in the world today, maybe not for too long, but today. But he cannot say that from tomorrow, people will not be equal in America. The Those who are born here, they will be superior to those who are later immigrants. 
or a male will be superior to female, or if he's a feminist, then women will be superior to men. He can't say that because American tradition has a tradition, intellectual tradition, that all men are created equal. Even if nobody believes that anyone is created, uh, today a typical high school student believes that nobody was ever created. So the um, Declaration of Independence is a nonsensical statement that we take these as self-evident truth that all men are created equal. Nobody is created, and everybody has evolved, and nobody evolves equal. So even though intellectually the foundational ideas of the USA have been destroyed, uh, the fact is that the power of those traditional ideas that all men are created equal cannot be overruled by the ruler of today. Mm. The process of just demolishing the idea that all people are created equal is a long process which begins with Charles Darwin and continues and begins to dominate. Eventually, when the consensus has gone that all men are created uh, and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, then a state of California can acquire, give to itself the right to kill newborn babies because God never created those babies. God never endowed an in, inalienable right to life on these people, uh, on, the, on those babies. Rights are what the state gives, and therefore the state, the fools that govern a state, they can take those rights away because they believe they are the ones who are given. But the population has to accept those ideas first, that the rights right. are man-made rights, state-given rights, and therefore state can take it. So, so to say that language, not ethnicity, is the foundation of a nation and makes a nation great or terrible. This is to say that ideas, philosophy, and this is where education comes in. The if I could interject real quick before you transition fully to education, because I think there's just two things worth bringing out in what you said. One is there are a number of missiologists that are beginning to pivot a little bit more to talking about language groups, seeing that language is a little more fundamental than ethnicity, which is ultimately we are all made of you know, one blood, right? Act 17, whereas language really leads to particular distinctions in, in, in worldviews and in access to the gospel, because either I can read the text of scripture that you're giving me and understand the gospel that you're presenting to me, or I can't. Those are two important things there. And also the the other thing that I, I think is is worth camping out on as you transition to to talk to us about education is simply this idea that, yeah, ideas stick around in a people longer than governing institutions and longer than ideologies that are sort of pushed down by a political class down onto a people. And that's good news for missionaries, because this is a time when many people could be discouraged by the current political state of affairs in our nation, in India, in anywhere else. And yet the good news is that the gospel spreads at this popular level, injecting these ideas of number number one, the, the truth of the lordship of Christ and how to be saved, but number two, everything else about what it means to live a life ordered before God and before his standards. Those ideas can spread regardless of whatever political regimes are coming and going, and ultimately whatever they try to accomplish can't really combat the, the organic power of how the gospel changes peoples over time. And that's encouraging. So tell us about education, too. Well, uh, I've just traveled to five Spanish-speaking countries, Spain, uh, Paraguay, Chile, Peru, and Colombia. The missionary movement in America boasted of its tremendous success in South America with some justification that in these countries, uh, 15, 17, 18 percent, 20 percent people have become Christians. But missionary movement did not give one single Protestant university to, say, Chile. Mm. Why not? And Dr. Winter re recognized it. He published an article on the 12 mistakes. He gave this as a paper in Korea, the 12 mistakes that the missionary movement has made. And the number one mistake that he you know, pointed out is that we give Bible schools, we did not give universities. 
Well, and can I just throw something in there as well? I was yes. just having lunch with Bob Trout. Many of our ABWE people will know the name Bob Trout, and he's been on this show before as well, but he's a veteran ABWE missionary who's planted over 30 churches in Columbia, and he was telling me that he's going down to teach at a Bible college in January uh, in Bogota. But this is a part of the world where within ABWE and other organizations, yeah, we've talked a lot about the, the evangelistic fruitfulness there that you can see a lot of individual professions of faith as you're going about even doing cold contact evangelism. But he was sharing that they need over $100,000 to even be able to fully accredit the school. And so they're having a hard time transitioning to any kind of a larger institution. And they're kind of stuck in some way being at this Bible college level where it's informal, it's not fully accredited, it's not fully endorsed. And so that, that kind of gets at what you're saying is that, yeah, we can see individual conversions, but uh, we don't always do a good job building institutions and those matter too. But I, I do think that there, that's a little bit, it's a little bit narrow scoped there because Protestants have started universities in like, for instance, China or Africa. Mm. I think it was places potentially, and I, I love you, you probably have more insight into this than I do, but like maybe those places where Christianity in the form of Catholicism had gone and there were already mm. universities, there wasn't the same push to start new universities. But to say that Protestants didn't start universities, I don't think is true. I'm saying evangelicals, American evangelicals did not yeah. start. So Protestants started all the, all the American universities and Ivy League colleges. Evangelicals abandoned them. Behind it was an epistemological reason. How do we know truth? Uh, what is Veritas? How do we know truth? So evangelical movement, as it developed, was a rejection of the university movement, which said that knowledge of truth comes to us by reading only the Bible, study only the Bible. You don't need to study the book of God's works, which is in nature and culture. The way to know truth is by studying the Bible. Sola scriptura means read only the Bible. This became the foundation. So when these people, the missionary movement, went to South America, yes, they did not take American Protestant Christianity to Colombia or Chile. They took American evangelical Christianity with its anti-intellectualism. They did not give the universities to these people. In Brazil, there are a number of universities. All of them had non-American origins. So obviously, with people like William Carey, the missionary movement as it came to India, uh, under Abraham Kuyper's influence, the missionary movement that is spread in Indonesia. Indonesia has six or seven or eight Christian universities, all the older universities were started by the Dutch missionary movement. So the missionary movement in the 19th century until the beginning of the 20th century believed in universities. But gradually, American evangelical mind turned against the university. And why that happened will be the topic of my lecture in Labri uh, annual conference in February 17th, 18th, the history of why evangelicalism turned right. against Protestant Christianity, which was an educational revolution. Let's shift a little bit, because without getting into all of the detailed, intricate history of how evangelicalism develops, I think we'll have some listeners that are maybe confused and say, well, but but I'm an evangelical. I mean, evangelical, you know, it's euangelion, it's the gospel. I believe in the gospel. And I, I think there's a difference between maybe critiquing evangelicalism, specifically neo-orthodoxy in the 20th century, critiquing that as a social movement and distinguishing what it means historically, even coming out of the Reformation to be an evangelical. And those are some things that we could sketch out if we have a little bit more time to create that nuance. But what I'd love to hear from you then is in light of some of the things that you're forcing us to reflect on too, because even though we might you know, approach things a little bit differently. Uh, I think that we're resonating with certain things like, okay, we can't only be focused on individual conversions to the exclusion of where is a society going. Uh, we have to have a full orbed biblical definition of things like nation, which involves a lot of different variables as we're thinking through those things. And yes, the importance of education too, as part of the discipleship process. You've recently spoken and written a little bit also, Vishal, about missions as a call to arms. Now, we're recording this around the Christmas time. 
of course, Jesus is the Prince of Peace, right? And, and we're supposed to put on the shoes of the, the readiness given by the gospel of peace. There's so much good news in Scripture about having peace with God through Christ. But in what way would you say, in light of some of these things, that missions is a, a call to arms as well, that there's a, a sort of spiritual combat between light and dark for someone who's taking the gospel into difficult places? Well, thank you. In fact, in that particular essay that Dr. Winter presented to the Korean missionary movement, his first, mis- it's called 12 mistakes that the evangelical movement made. The first was that it gave Bible seminaries, not universities. The last one, uh, the 12th accusation, the mistake that he uh, refers to is that we presented the gospel as a means to uh, get out, go to heaven instead of hell. We did not present the gospel as a call to arms, that when a person becomes, accepts the kingdom of God, he is uh, automatically becoming a soldier of the kingdom of God against the kingdom of Satan. So both the gospel of Matthew, gospel of Luke, in Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, before describing the ministry of Jesus where he's going out to proclaim and teach the kingdom of heaven has come, Satan appears to Jesus and says that these are my kingdoms, the kingdoms of this world, their glory, their splendor, their authority is mine. Is Satan bluffing Jesus? No, Jesus accepts that Satan is the prince of this world. Paul accepts that we are wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities of this dark age in the heavenly places and in this dark world. John makes that astounding statement in 1 John 5, 19, that we know that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. It's not just a pilot, a governor, who can say to that this prisoner is... Uh, unjustly imprisoned, there is no basis for a charge against him, and then go on to uh, crucify an innocent man. This is kingdom of injustice. But Caesar himself can set fire to a portion of Jerusalem, of Rome, blame perfectly innocent people who are friends of John. John knows them, has uh, blessed them and been blessed by them. Nero emperor is burning them alive as torches. Kingdom of Rome, Satan is saying, this is my kingdom. Jesus and Paul and Peter and John are agreeing that this is kingdom of Satan. Satan is real. Satan is active. This is the point that uh, Lewis is making in Narnia, that although Narnia is created by Aslan, the white witch has taken over. Mm. This is the point Tolkien is making mm-hmm. in Lord of right. the Rings that yeah, it's a evil eye is ruling. But if we are not engaged in a war. We should not be fighting the kingdom of Satan so that God's will is done on this earth, that God's kingdom should come. This was Dr. Winter's own complaint against the missionary movement that he guided or misguided. We are not producing soldiers to make sure that in Satan's kingdom, God's will is coming and God's kingdom is coming and his will is being done. But the point that yes, that when a person accepts the kingdom of God, Jesus as king, Jesus as Lord, he gets into a war against kingdom of Satan. Right. This is where education comes in, that we are fighting with a sword which comes out of Christ's mouth. What comes out of his mouth is word. His word is not just the seed that is sown for the kingdom of God. His word is the sword that Mm -hmm. demolishes the kingdom of Satan to establish the kingdom of God. So his word received in our hearts when he begins to write God's law. So what evangelicalism has forgotten is the legacy, which begins actually with Elkwin, an English theologian, 
who taught Emperor Charlemagne that to convert is to educate. Charlemagne thought, this is 8th century, 9th century, that to convert someone is to baptize someone. So he told the pagans that you get baptized, otherwise off with your heads. Elquin was returning from Rome to England, and he took a detour to see Emperor Charlemagne, and he, when he saw his enthusiasm for converting the pagans, he said, wait a minute, faith comes from hearing. Hearing comes from the word of God. You have to teach them the word of God. To convert is to educate, not to baptize someone. So this is, this is a problem that American crusade evangelism created, that to convert someone means have someone come forward in all response to an altar call and pray the sinner's prayer. That's conversion. But Elkwain had already taught, uh, which led to the first education revolution in Europe, that to convert someone is to help have the Spirit of God write the law of God in human heart. That is being right. born again when your heart right. is transformed. Now, this is what St. Boniface had taught before Elquin to Germany, that to convert is to educate. That became the heart of Luther's third, second education revolution, uh, which he wrote, wrote in 1520, that to convert someone is to educate. In 1530, right. Luther preached a very fiery sermon Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He wrote it out, so anyone can read that sermon. He says to the Germans, he's speaking to the parents, that you are concerned about what shall we eat, what shall we drink, how shall we stay warm, and for that reason you're not sending your children to school. This is what pagans seek. You seek God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So they ask, how should we seek God's kingdom and his righteousness? Luther says, send your children to school, keep them there for 10 years. Of course, there are secular schools in Germany. When he says, send your children to school, he means send your children to pastor's home or to the church, parish school, where pastors will educate your child for 10 years. Once your child understands God's will, God's mind, and does it, that's when the kingdom of God will come in Germany. Mm -hmm. So, well, Vishal, we're running out of time here, and so we've got to cut things off, but we deeply appreciate uh, your, your insights there, and you're tying in lots of history, and hopefully our listeners are challenged to go back and study their history because history is God's story. It's the story that he's writing, and for the last 2,000 years, that story has been the story of the influence of Christ and the truth that he brought to the world on societies, sometimes doing well with that truth, other times not doing so well with it. But there's a lot of things that we can learn, especially by listening to a voice such as your own and recognizing there's some things that, by God's grace, American evangelicalism has gotten right. And there's plenty of things that, by uh, unfortunately, God's uh, grace also allows us and has mercy on us. But there's some things that we've gotten wrong as American evangelicals as well. So, Vishal Mangawadi, we are so grateful to have you again on the show. We appreciate all of your important work. And people can follow you at revolutionmovement.com. Is that correct? Uh, revelation. Uh, revelation. Sorry, revelation. Revelation. We do have Freudian another website, there. thirdeducationrevolution.com. Uh, that's the proposal of what to do in future. But my website is more revelationmovement.com. Revelationmovement.com and third education uh, revolution. We appreciate your work. Thank you so yes, much, Vishal. Look forward to seeing you out here in the Bay Area in the near future. I will send you the information about it in a moment. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, sir. Well, Vishal Mangalwadi is a smart man and has many things to say. We could have kept going for a long time. And we're very grateful for his expertise. But sometimes we uh, we do have to stop while we're still wanting a little bit more, right? And and right. talk about what has landed on us so far. And so uh, I know we want to interact a little bit with some of the things that he's saying and and making some generalizations. But but I think that there's things that we can right. interact with. And so it seems to me, Scott, and correct me if you think I'm wrong, that that overall Vishal's argument is is something like. 
a nation isn't just an ethno-linguistic people group. Therefore, the Great Commission, which is to disciple all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and so on, isn't just about giving ethno-linguistic people groups, the 7,400 of them, however many Joshua Project would count, isn't just about getting them access to the good news of how to be saved. That's a critical piece, and that's where it starts. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that he's saying, first of all, a nation is a lot more. A nation Mm -hmm. also involves culture and language and ideas. And so not only do they need to be exposed to the gospel, but they also have to be taught. And so discipling is more than just conversion. It's also the whole process of education afterwards. And really the fruit, the end result of that product is something like what he sees happening throughout the history of the world, which is that the Bible itself and the whole counsel of God is transforming every nation and culture that it comes into contact with over a long-term process. And it seems to me that he's encouraging missionaries to come at the missionary task with a a spirit of boldness in light of just the the size and scale of the kingdom of God. That's what I hear him saying, and I think there's some things that we can interact with there. I also want to recognize, though, he's making some pretty challenging critiques of the way that American missionaries have approached things. And it does cause us to want to look ourselves in the mirror, regardless of whether or not we maybe embrace the full spirit of his critique, Scott. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I didn't agree with a lot of his conclusions. I think that there was some broad brushing. And I also believe that you, we can't compare a, a snapshot of a very short window of time in evangelical history with a large, much larger window of, you know, Christendom or even of Protestant Christendom. I, I think it's kind of like saying, well, Alex, I knew you between the ages of 15 and 18. Therefore I know your philosophy of life. Well, no, I mean, even, even knowing you now, I know that, you know, some of the things in the ways you believe and and think are going to be nuanced out over the next 20 years. You know, that's just the way we are. Like we, we take a look at our whole life, not just a snapshot of the life. So here, here are some questions that I feel like maybe you and I can wrestle with. Cause I think there's, even some nuances of difference between you and I that would maybe be reflected in that is, you know, one, the, the discipling of the nations, how does that come? You know, is does that come through gaining seats of power or, you know, seven mountains of influence and uh, having <laughs> dominion in those areas? Or does it come more in the way of a, a patient ferment has been talked about, you know? Uh, is it, does it come by individuals being saved and those having an influence or does it come through some kind of top down structure or is it a little bit of both? And, you know, uh, also, I think when it comes down to the, the, you know, the questions of discipleship, to what end do we pursue things like justice and how do we pursue justice? I think everyone, even those who would say, well, you know, social justice is a woke concept and those who say no social justice is essential to the gospel both in the end would say they want God's justice, right? Mm-hmm. So the, the question isn't really about, do we want justice? Do we want God's justice? I mean, even amongst faithful Christians, I'm talking about, obviously mm-hmm. there's a whole another group that doesn't care at all about what God says, but amongst faithful Christians that how do we pursue justice? Mm-hmm. That seems to be kind of where the rub comes in. And then when it comes down to missionaries, like his critique is American evangelical missionaries were pursuing conversions not building the institutions that will help people to grow and can become full uh, disciples of Jesus Christ and influence a nation that way. And I guess we could even discuss whether we think that that's accurate. Is that what Christian missionaries are doing? Because certainly we work with an agency that I think certainly we care about evangelism, but uh, I see us building institutions as well. So anyway, do you think I framed that okay? No, I, I mean, I think those are massive questions. Those are a lot to bite off in a bonus segment. <laughs> you probably can't. Yeah. I just, but defining some of the tension, I think, is part yes. of the, you know, where is the tension? Because it's easy those to get lost of like, you don't through. believe in justice. Well, sure I do. Yeah. How do you see it coming about? Right. The, those are the questions to think through. And uh, particularly on the first one, how does change happen? Is change even the goal? And I think at this point, one thing that more and more evangelicals, people that are thinking about the Bible and reading it seriously, whatever denominational background they come from, mm-hmm. I think one thing that more and more people are are realizing is that whatever your view of history is, whatever your view of eschatology is, it's not going to be helpful to the missionary task to have a short-term strategy only, a strategy right. that depends right. on you know, this is going to end tomorrow, and so we're not going to plan for the future and so certainly having a long-term vision of, hey, is, is seeing change in a society where 
the ways the laws of that society become more just, where individuals are increasingly ordering their lives uh, according to God's law, God's precepts. Mm-hmm. Is that is that a goal? Is that even desired? Not even the primary, but is that even a secondary goal? I'm seeing right. people from all sorts of tribes and camps sort of react against the version of evangelicalism that was maybe hyper-focused on only an individual moment of salvation and nothing else beyond that. I'm seeing a lot more people thinking long-term and thinking collectively in that way, and I think that that's helpful, and we need to remain biblically grounded while we're doing that and remember that that change, if it comes at all, it comes through individual hearts being transformed and making decisions together as hearts that are walking uh, according to the light that they've received uh, through Christ. That's the one thing that I would say. The other thing, and I just want to throw this out there for our missionary audience, how do we regard nominalism? What do I mean by nominalism? Well, just talk about being a nominal Christian. Think about that concept of the countries and nations, especially throughout the West, that are nominally one denomination or another, or nominally Roman Catholic or nominally that. And really, do you have a glass half full or a glass half empty approach to that? There's certainly cons to nominalism. I think any of our missionaries in Europe or in Latin America could say there's massive cons to nominalism from the standpoint of, well, you've got to convince a person that they don't know Christ before you introduce them to the biblical Christ. And that is certainly an issue with which to contend. Uh, but there's also the glass half full of, well, they, they have a foundation of certain Christian concepts. They have the, the grammar, they have the vocabulary to make sense of some of the gospel truth that we're trying to share. And not to mention those societies very often are ordered in a way that makes it a lot easier for missionaries to openly operate, not completely, but a lot easier compared to countries that are still closed legally to the gospel and closed to missionaries as well. And so whether it's a top down, whether it's a bottom up, you know, I think the question becomes, okay, well, as we're seeking to win individuals to the Lord, what happens when one of those individuals is Emperor Constantine. Do we want him to pass just laws and get rid of the pagan sacrifices or not? And we cross those bridges as we get to them. But I think what's most important is that, look, we're in a day of culture war all around us, but you can't have a culture war without having a culture, just like you can't fight a naval battle without Navy ships, I heard someone recently say. And so for Christians, we have this gospel, and that gospel produces a culture in our families, in our own lives, in our churches. And that's a culture that's worth sharing. It's not perfect because we still sin, but that's something that's good. And we should think through how can we steward that and how can we be a blessing to the nations, not only be saved, but back to that Genesis 12 vision, how can we be a blessing to the other peoples, the other families, the other nations of the earth, just like Abraham's family was called to be. Right. And I mean, I would, just as me speaking for me personally, I I think you can see, in Acts and then then coming out of the book of Acts, that the focus was on, you know, whole life discipleship of people as they were being saved. I mean, it wasn't just about getting them converted and then leaving them. It was about seeing them become fully devoted followers of Jesus. But as that happened, it did percolate up. You know, you have believers now that are going into every place. And while it doesn't seem like, and I I guess somebody could argue against this, that, that Paul's intention was, Okay, I'm gonna plant. I'm gonna. I'm gonna try to gain the seats of power in Rome. But what it did happen is people were converted and they were leading others to Lord. It did begin to impact all levels of Roman society to the point that by the time of Constantine, it wasn't Constantine came late to the party because it was already happening in Rome. You know, like right. he he saw That's the right. way that the wind was blowing and joined with that. Now there was downsides to Constantine becoming a Christian too. He started just baptizing the nations uh, quite literally by just sprinkling water on people and calling them Christian. And that caused all sorts of problems. But, but also we, we do, I, I think have to, my second idea behind this is that there's also a sense of like the providence of God in all these things. Like yeah. we can look at these episodes in history and go, it shouldn't yeah. have done it that way. Like this, mm. this wasn't a sanctified move, but mm. God takes mm. those broken pieces and puts together something quite beautiful yeah. out of it. You know, um, the the devastation of Zebulon in uh, the Kings and Chronicles uh, is becomes the the beauty of the gospel coming to Galilee first mm-hmm. in in Mark chapter one. You know, so but seeing how God is God is working through and in, 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 uh, accomplishing His purposes despite the brokenness of the world we're in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does make you praise God for history. Yeah, you know, back to you know, is your is your mm-hmm. nominalism glass half 
full or half empty. You know, at Christmas, like we should be grieved by the commercialism. We should be grieved by the paganism, the sorts of things where you look at it and you're like, that's not honoring the heart of Christ. Right. And yet when I read Isaiah nine and I read that the government shall be upon his shoulders and I read about all of these titles and, and how is this kingdom going to expand? Well, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. When I read that, I can't help but smile that here I am surrounded, yes, in a, in a country that's godless in so many ways. Yeah. And wherever your context is, you certainly look out and you see lostness all around you. And yet as I look out, I still see, oh, here's here's a lot of unbelievers celebrating the birth of the Messiah, whether they know it or not. And they have yeah. all of these layers of tradition on top of celebrating the birth of the Messiah. And that is a powerful apologetic. That does not come to be in the ordinary course of human history unless the Lord Jesus Christ is alive, reigning on a throne, accomplishing the spread of his gospel and his church providentially through history, through the ups and downs and the things that we get right and the things that we get very wrong sometimes, especially when we're given power. And he's extending his kingdom. And what an amazing thing so that we can even look at countries that are half reached. They're nominal. Mm-hmm. They they have some Christian identity, but but they're not all the way there yet. And we can look at that and say, well, what an amazing thing that God has done and how much more we have left to do. And it is a call to arms in that way that we can arm ourselves with that boldness and we can begin to, dare I say, finish the task as Vishal was encouraging us. We can continue to contend for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. Scott, any last words on our bonus talk here? I just would say, you know, just a little anecdote that I think highlights, I think what you were just saying is, you know, we when we were missionaries, we had these Jewish friends. They were nominal Jews. They didn't practice anything. They didn't have any faith at all. They had rejected Judaism. They rejected that concept of God. But but in a moment of clarity, the wife during at Christmas time, you know, we were getting ready to celebrate Christmas, and and she she with a little bit of longing in her eyes said, you know, Christmas is so beautiful. It it makes me want to become a Christian, and uh, and and I recognize like that was not a gospel. Uh, that was not her professing the gospel at all. But there was right. something beautiful, right. I think, about seeing the expression of of why of our wonder and our beauty and our celebration of of God breaking through the night of darkness and giving us uh, salvation through the sun. That in that common grace kind of way, mixed with the truth of God's revealed word, was impacting mm-hmm. her in a way that she saw it as good and beautiful. And I, I do think as Christians, we're trying to develop a, a world and live a life that our world around us will hear the message and then also see the life behind it and go, that is a beautiful mm. and compelling story that I want to believe. And I think that goes along with what Vishal was, was saying. It certainly goes along with what he's written and what we've been saying, I think, you know, all along. That's right. Absolutely. So that's what we're doing here on this show is you might even say, Scott, that we're helping goers think and thinkers go. We've done I some thinking. So. And now it's time to go. So thanks again for joining us on this episode of the Missions Podcast, which is a ministry of ABWE. To get more content, go to abwe.org. To support the show, go to missionspodcast.com slash support. Remember to leave us a positive rating and a five-star review in your platform of choice to help get this content in front of others that can be blessed by it. Whether you're listening or whether you're watching on YouTube or elsewhere on the web, thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next week on the Missions Podcast. Bye-bye.